Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Literacy Podcast. Melissa and Lori love literacy. We are so excited to talk about this topic today. It's one we've wanted to talk about for a while, and we have the right guest, the right topic, (laughs) and we actually have a series in mind, so (laughs) even better. We'll see where this goes. (laughs) Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about assessments, and we touched on this before with Meredith Lieben and Sue Pimentel and we just think there's so much more to explore here. So Melissa, I know you're especially excited for this. Yeah. Yeah. I think with, um, Jared Mir- Miracle, Mir- Miracle. Yes. <laughs> we, we all, <laughs> can't say his name right, but we did have a really great discussion about assessment with him too and how it mm-hmm. needs to, you know, we need to start looking at it differently. And so really excited to talk to Lior Clears today from Great Minds. And he is the director of assessment for the humanities team which is our ELA in history. Um, So yeah, welcome, Lior. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Lior, do you want to tell our audience a little bit about, you know, your your background? And I think the most interesting is how did you get to a place where assessment (laughs) is your thing? (laughs) Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I never I never thought I'd be an assessment guy. I'll be honest. That was <laughs> not necessarily a life path I'd ever <laughs> considered or planned. And 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 to be frank, I, I still don't really consider myself an assessment guy. So um, apologies to any psychometricians or assessment experts listening if I if I get anything wrong because it's it's not something that I had a a classical or, or traditional training in. I'm a bit of an interloper in that space, and and that's okay. I think that's that's actually one of the reasons why I'm interested in, in getting into it. So I started out as as a teacher, just like like you all, and I'm sure most of the, most of our listeners. But I taught high school English, and I, I was always most interested in the education space and content. You know, what books my students were reading, mm-hmm. how to teach them how to write, what they were writing about. Uh, it taught for six years in, in North Carolina and then in Tennessee, and then took a jump to work at the state level at the Tennessee Department of Education. This was about a decade ago, back in the early days of Common Core implementation. And I was working on some of the early Race to the Top initiatives that, that was funded by that, that federal grant, the Tennessee one. And there were some assessment needs. And I think people just realized that I had an ELA subject area background. So I kind of got roped in and eventually became the ELA coordinator for the state of Tennessee. So Tennessee already had a testing program at the time. They didn't necessarily need me to inform that. What they did need me to do is review the assessments. So this is what I found out after I accepted this role. If I, if I had known, I might have, I might have thought <laughs> otherwise. But no, I, I joke. I mean, it was, it's, yeah, every job has, has tough components. Every job has a little bit of drudgery. So, so the drudgery for this job was reviewing the assessments. And, and by the assessments, I mean all of them. So, you know, Tennessee, like most states, tests grade 3 through 11 in English language arts. And each grade has multiple forms. So we're talking about hundreds of pages of test forms. And there's a lot of redundancy. It's not like each one is unique which makes it even harder because you're right. reading the same thing three or four different times and making sure that the same mistakes aren't, aren't repeated, but you have to read every word. Uh, and this was a bit old fashioned. So we literally would just print out hundreds of pages of paper and these were secure test items. So I'd, I would lock myself in a conference room <laughs> and make sure no one else was looking. Like I had to be careful about taking this stuff home and that kind of thing. And, and I would just review it and I would just look for mistakes. And these were test items that had been through development and, and psychometrics and, and bias review, teacher review. They're all very polished. I was like the last check, the last man standing between these and students. So it, it was a very daunting task because it, it combined drudgery with incredibly high stakes. <laughs> like if I missed, you know, let, let's say one of the answers was keyed in wrong. You know, the answer was B and, and the test form said C. If I didn't catch that. Thousands of students in Tennessee would have gotten, you know, scored incorrectly and, and who knows what their application. I think mean, there are ways to fix that after the fact, but it's, it's not good to have to do that. So um, <laughs> in reviewing these assessments, I kind of started to become more of an assessment guy. I had to learn a lot about assessment theory and assessment design. I, I had colleagues who really supported me for that. But one of the things that I think that 
that benefited me in that role, being an interloper and outsider in the assessment space was I wasn't necessarily looking for the same things that assessment specialists, people trained in, in measurement and psychometrics are looking for. So for instance, and again, this is pretty common core. I, I'd have to clarify things, a lot of things have changed since then. Um, but there were things I noticed that really struck me as, as odd about, about these tests. And, and this isn't just about Tennessee, this is most states, I, I think had, had similar issues. So one was the passages. So as, as you all know, pre-Common Core, we didn't really have this concept of complex text at each grade level. And we didn't necessarily prioritize the authenticity and quality and rigor of text. And so a lot of assessment passages back then were what we call canned, which is to say they were commissioned. They were written by assessment developers, not by actual authors, not published in, in real publications. And there's obvious reasons why assessment developers traditionally did that kind of thing. It allows them to control the passage. They can control the length. They can control the complexity. They can control the vocabulary. They don't have to worry about permissions, which is a huge barrier in, in price when it comes to assessments. And most importantly, they can write passages in such a way that the passages are optimized to be able to ask certain questions about those passages. And you all know what those questions are. It's a type of multiple choice questions you see on, on standardized tests aligned to, to state standards. And what I realized is the people who are commissioned to these tests must all have been grandmas. And I say that with, we, we love our grandmas. Like we, we couldn't do it without them. I, but I, I just wondered, like, should grandmas be writing, uh, writing tests or should we have a more diverse uh, set of passage writers? I think was more of my question, right. right? Because on every single grade level, there was inevitably one passage about a kid reconnecting with his grandma. It had always happened. That is hilarious. And, and it was kind of like, I don't know if you two ever read uh, Highlights when you were in grade oh, school. Oh, yeah, for sure. Totally. You know, like the types of magazines that are written just for students, right? Mm -hmm. And you remember Goofus and Gallant? You remember that comic strip? Do you know that this is the second time today that people have brought that up? Really? Goofus yeah. and Gallant? Yeah, I was on a call earlier and somebody brought it up. So That's I remember crazy. it because my memory has been jogged and I feel like... <laughs> I wish there was some sort of lottery I could play with the G and G or something, you know. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. You have, to, <laughs> you have to explain it though. That's so funny. Yeah, something go in ahead. the air about, about Goofus and Gallant. <laughs> yeah, so you remember. So so Gallant always did the right thing, right? Yes. So these assessment passages, it was like if Gallant wrote the assessment passages. It was yeah. like if if history had not happened, if everything was like a nice like 1950s leave it to beaver type of situation where, you know, at the beginning of the passage, the kid would be off from, it would be about a kid. The kid would be off from school and grandma would say like, Hey, like, will you come me, uh, help me reorganize my attic this summer? And the kid's like, eh, I, don't, I don't really know, but okay. Like whatever, I got nothing to do. And the kid gets into the attic and gripes about it. And then the kid discovers like some old memento of grandma's and goes ask grandma what it's about. And grandma says, oh, like that was grandma, grandpa's medal from when he served in World War II. Or, or that was like my old um, uh, set of paintbrushes when I used to be an artist. And they'd have this warm conversation and it would always end with the kid saying, wow, grandma, I never knew you were so interesting. I mean, it was like not literally, but that that was essentially the tenor of the passage. So it, it was just like the nature of these passages were so pat and predictable and traditional. And they were all about these just most banal and empty of scenarios where nothing really happens. <laughs> and it just communicated sort of this, this trite moral at the end, which like, does nothing to serve the, the real diverse student populations, you know, right. in terms of like the diversity of students that we serve with different <laughs> family structures, different backgrounds, different cultures, but also it was just so incredibly dull. Like <laughs> how much do kids really like to, I mean, Kids have great relationships with their grandparents. Do they really like to learn about the importance of reconnecting with grandma on yeah. a test? When well, you're already really stressed in yeah. that situation. By the seventh passage of me cleaning out grandma's attic, you know, the, as a second grader reading it, I think I might be a little bit bored. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it, it drove me nuts. And so that was uh, me just sitting there reviewing it. So thank, go thank goodness Common Core comes along and now we have authentic passages. But it was just one of those examples where it's coming from outside the assessment world. I was, I was really struck by how things were done. So gradually, I, I became more and more involved in assessment at the Tennessee Department of Education, then eventually at Great Minds. And, and I've been very thankful to the people I've worked with who have allowed me to work in that space, even though I, I don't have that PhD in, in measurement. And uh, in my work, I rely on specialists and psychometricians to help fill in that bit. But I also think it's, it's really important when it comes to assessment that people with content backgrounds play a strong role in design and development. 
Because what happens otherwise, you end up with sort of these incredibly stale multiple choice tests that aren't really aligned to classroom instruction and, and really don't speak to, to the needs of our students and, and have no engagement factor whatsoever. Yep. So um, at Great Minds, I recently became the director of assessment for the humanities team, and, and I work on all of our uh, curriculum assessment work and our innovative assessment work and just lots of exciting things going on in that world as, as we try to figure out how we can improve assessment and, and do it better uh, than, than what, what's been done traditionally. Yeah. So we haven't done it well. Is that what you're saying, Lior? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not pointing any fingers and naming any names, but no, we, no I we don't have. think we have. I think Lori and I have owned it that like we ourselves haven't necessarily used assessments um, terribly well and have seen even at you know district wide and Lori statewide. Um, I, I don't I don't know that we have. I don't think <laughs> especially we, we, we talk about when you get to you know third grade and above in in reading comprehension tests that we really are. We're not do not doing a great job and sometimes doing it and I think Meredith and Sue said this right sometimes we're like causing harm yeah <laughs> by using the data twofold. and assessments in ways yeah. they weren't meant to be yeah it's like two a twofold and I'd love to hear Lior's thoughts on this yes. too but it's it we're not doing it well yet <laughs> in the way of giving students the actual test right so this the test is not done well. And then also the way that educators are using the data from that assessment that is Mm -hmm. um, right now seems, you know, could be improved. Um, So it's like the input and the output both need some rejigging or yeah, yeah, redoing. (laughs) What do you think, Lior? Yeah, I mean, there's this this great article that I, I think about a lot. Uh, it's called Garbage In, Garbage Out. Uh, and it, it really gets to that input-output uh, idea you were talking about, Lori. Uh, and it's by by Todd Rose uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And and Todd Rose has written a lot about some of the, the damaging aspects that, that you were mentioning, Lori. Um, the things that we often don't think about when we see an assessment report and we see the numbers that come out of it. And we take action and do things based on those reports. So the idea of garbage in and garbage out being, well, if if there's problems with the assessment design, or even if there aren't problems with the assessment design, but problems with the way that data is gathered and presented and the way Mm -hmm. and the inferences that we can draw or not draw from that data, and we reach false claims, it it doesn't really matter how how nice the output is and how beautiful the report is and how precise those numbers may appear. Uh, If if garbage is coming in, garbage is going to come out. And it's it's remarkable how many decisions and and, um, decisions that really affect students' lives are made based on data that to be frank is is kind of garbage, like a lot of the assessments out there. And and teachers, it's it's not their fault. They, They don't have access to what's what's on the inside, you know, in terms of that input output model. Yeah. A lot of standardized assessments and assessments that are sold are under lock and key for understandable reasons. Teachers don't get to know what the content is, what the items are, what the passages are, how is the data derived, what formulas lead to it. And they're trusting their leaders who are giving them these assessments and saying they're good. And a lot of times the leaders don't really know themselves. You know, they've been subject to a sales pitch by an assessment vendor that tells them all these great things this assessment is going to do for you. And, and what I've noticed is that there's there's not a lot of, of reflection and really looking under the hood to sort of see, well, wait a second, like what is the actual mechanism here? What is the path of the data? What does the data mean? What is it really showing us about our students? And is the data making or implying claims that we can't really make based on the way the assessment is designed? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm imagining a lot of listeners taking like a big exhale right now. I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that he said that. And I'm also imagining a lot of other people thinking, oh my gosh, if I have to sift through one more thing to figure out if it's legit or not, I'm <laughs> like, it just seems overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. And I'm imagining too, like, I remember Lori probably sitting with you looking at like beautiful graphs and charts and colors and from, from the different assessments we had. And I, 
like I would just get frustrated because like, sure, they got this question wrong. But Leah, like you're saying, like, I don't even know what the question actually was. I don't know what the passage actually was. Mm -hmm. I really don't know why the student chose the wrong answer, because it could be a million different reasons, for you know, the lack of background knowledge or their vocabulary or something about the way the question was worded. Like it could have been a million things. So we're sitting here trying to like, surmise. Melissa, yeah. I'm also thinking when I taught high school, Lee, or you might remember this too, like thinking, oh, the student just might have been tired. <laughs> Maybe right, they like just chose B. <laughs> you know, but but we don't we don't know all that just from looking at those graphs and charts and pretty colors. Yeah. I think too, there's, yeah. I, I want to name too, there, there are good data sources. So like, I know we're going to get to that, but just for anyone listening, we will get there. We're, we're just, we still, we went all in on the not great things first. Yeah. Well, it's a, you know, it's, 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 it's a good trajectory. We'll, we'll end with the positive. Um, yeah. but, but I would, I would it's just recommend for, for, for people, for, um, you know, if you're out there listening and, and what, what Melissa and Lori are resonating for you, there is a great, um, keynote address at, at last year's beyond multiple choice conference, which, which I attended virtually in 2021 and beyond multiple choice is a conference where a bunch of assessment developers get together and think about what could we do better than multiple choice? Are there better options out there? So Jay McTigg of, of education fame, of backwards design fame, like everyone you know, has, read, has read his books, gave, gave a great keynote. It was, it was brilliant. And what was brilliant about it is he didn't get into all of the technicalities of psychometrics, so I'm sure he could, but he really returned us to the basics. And, and one, one of the things that he said is that and I think he was quoting from a psychometric test textbook here where he said any system and he, he defined assessment as any systematic basis for making inferences about characteristics of people. So an assessment isn't the assessment itself. It's what allows us to make inferences about characteristics of people. So why is inferences important here? And this this gets to the examples you were talking about, Melissa and Lori. You can never assess everything. It's not realistic. If I'm an English teacher and I have taught 200 vocabulary words over the course of the year, I cannot ask my students about all 200. That would take too long. So what do I do? I sample. I ask them maybe about 20. And based on their responses to those 20 vocabulary questions, I make an inference about their vocabulary knowledge about the whole 200. They get 18 out of 20 correct. Okay, it's a 90. I'm going to make an inference that they know 90% of my 200 vocabulary words, right? That's how assessment operates. And what Matilda is pointing out is that an assessment is only as strong as the inferences you can make from it. So to your point, if I have given my students a math assessment and my students fail, is it because they didn't know the math or is it because my students didn't have breakfast that morning? Is the assessment really sensitive enough to pick up that difference? And the answer in most cases is probably not, <laughs> unless there's a question on the assessment that says, did you have breakfast? Or maybe if I'm a proctor, am I walking around and maybe I'm gonna see how my students are reacting so, you know, McTigg gives this great example of, of math word problems, which are notoriously tricky for assessment. <laughs> if my student got it wrong, is it because she didn't know the math or she couldn't read the problem or she didn't understand the problem? And if my report simply says zero out of one X read whatever for that item, what are the true and false inferences I can make based on that? And so I think it just really helps to ground us. And, and I don't know that there are there's ever going to be an assessment that allows for 100% complete inferences because we can't realistically gather information about every single contextual factor. To me, thinking about assessments in that way just brings a much needed correction and, and humility when it comes to interpreting the results. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just reminds me that these are real kids. These are real complex people. Let's be careful about the inferences we make and what we do with those inferences and balance those with everything else we know about our students. Yeah. Uh, Lior, I'm going to, I'm going to pull a Melissa and I'm going to say, let's back up a little bit. Melissa's always like, let's pause, let's back up. <laughs> so <laughs> she does this so well. So I'm going to, to say, let's pause for a second. And I think it might be helpful in our pre-call. We talked about data as a broad umbrella and both, yeah you know, the, the shortcomings of data, well, lots of shortcomings of data and the dangers of data. And I think it might be helpful to kind of dive into that a little bit right now. I loved how you talked about the allure of data and the distortion of data. So I'm wondering if you could share a bit about that before we, before we go any further into our data trek. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, a, a lot of my thoughts about assessment data are, are informed by a lot of reading and reflection I've been doing the past few years about data in general. 
Um, and I'm not a, a data guy. I didn't study statistics in college. So this is, is challenging material for me. And I think that's part of the problem, right, is very few teachers and school leaders are trained in statistical analysis and psychometrics and don't feel comfortable passing judgment. What I have learned and what I've really come to believe is that we as an education reform community, and I, I, take, I say this personally, like I'm a part of that community. I think a lot of us consider ourselves to be education reformers, have gone a little bit too far in promoting what, what, what I think of as the data regime. Uh, and what's the data regime? It's sort of this idea that everything in education needs to be tracked with certain data, and that data is a solution to all of our problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's essentially the, the philosophy that goes into state accountability systems, into thinking about school choice. You know, how do we know which, which schools are better than others and which are going to thrive? We have data that we can look at and we can decide what to promote. And, and I think part of it also comes from just, just we're technocrats. And what, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, I'm a technocrat. Like, I believe that ideally it's, it's the right research and the right policy and the right numbers that can fix our problems. And I think that's natural for a lot of us in the education reform space. We were good students ourselves. We liked education. We liked learning. We liked research. That's why we got into this. And so we often have this technocratic mindset that if, if we're just smart enough and think hard enough and have the right data in front of us, we, we can solve all these problems. And I mean, look at the past 10 years of like all of these reforms we've tried out, Common Core, nationwide testing consortiums, teacher accountability through increased teacher review and, and value added data. And, and all of these things made sense and had had strong research bases to support them. But the needle hasn't really moved. Like student achievement hasn't actually gotten that much better in the past 10 years. So it, for me, it's been, there's been some guilt in reflecting on the role that I played as being part of that data regime when I was working at the Tennessee Department of Education, constantly pushing data. Every time we talked to educators, it was about like, these assessments you need to give to your students because the data is so important. We need this data. We need more, more data. And, and we have all of it. And yet, why hasn't student achievement improved, right? I think that that's sort of the key question. So I think, I think one of the reasons is, you know, data has this, you mentioned, Lori, this allure to it. It's like... Um, there's this great um, article in The Atlantic recently called Why the Pandemic Experts Failed. Um, it's by Robinson Meyer and Alexis Madrigal, and it's about pandemic data. But it sort of gets at the same problem, which is, is people sort of assume that, that data is like a crystal ball. And, and you know, they use this, this analogy where you, you feel like you can peer into this crystal ball and data will be perfectly clear and objective and scientific, and it'll show you everything. In reality, they compare data to a, to a sewer, right? That it's actually a lot murkier than you think it is because of the sources of data and, right. and, the, diff, and the challenges in combining all of those sources and also the, the challenges in, in interpreting it and deciding what to do. So I think we, we have been mystified by this allure of data. We've let it distract us and we've let it, let it persuade us that somehow all of our problems are just about getting more and more and more precise data. And, and we're sort of ignoring some more important things there. Yeah, I love this article, by the way, <laughs> even though it was a little tough for me to read, but I, <laughs> I could make connections to it. And one of the quotes I pulled out was, um, and you did too, Liar, but I did on my own. <laughs> um, <it says laughs> Melissa's very I feel really, this. really good about it. <laughs> this data-driven thinking isn't necessarily more accurate than other forms of reasoning. And if you do not understand how data are made, their seams and scars, they might even be more likely to mislead you. And I don't know. That just hit me because it was like, yeah, I think that's so true on both ends, right? Like we think that, oh, if data says, then it's it. Like we don't even question it, you know? And then listening to this, this article of like, people didn't know where the data was coming from during the pandemic at first. Like it was all over the place, but we didn't question it because it was in a graph or a chart and we just went with it. Um, but so it can be really yeah. misleading. It can. And it, it can be dangerous. I, I really think it can be a dangerous fallacy. And, and like like you said, Lori, this isn't to say we're throwing all of the data out. Data is an important part of the picture. Mm -hmm. um, but but what, one of the one of the ways I really like to think about it is, is in some of my, my research over the past couple of years, as I was thinking about data reporting for literacy assessment, I came across this image known as, as the DIKW period. And I don't know who pyramid and I don't know who came up with it first, but I, I really like the concept. So imagine a pyramid. And the bottom of the pyramid is the D is data, but there are levels above that get to higher and higher levels of understanding. So above data is I information. So the idea that data is nice, but information can also include things that are not quantifiable, but mm -hmm. that are also important as a teacher. 
I get information every day from watching my students. It's not necessarily data that I can, I can, I can quantify or put in the chart, but I know I get, I get information from observing them from doing formative assessment. And then above information in the period is K, which is knowledge. Um, and, and that's obviously relevant for those of us who work in, in high quality curriculum and work on knowledge building materials. Right? We know the value of knowledge. Uh, information is nice, but knowledge is, is really what brings that information together into something more meaningful. And then at the tip of the pyramid, that apex is W is wisdom, right? So what is even more valuable than knowledge? It's wisdom. I, I think of that old adage, uh, it goes something along the lines of knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing not to put a tomato in a fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, like you can yep. know a lot of stuff in an encyclopedic way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the wisdom to know what to do about it or how to implement it. That's so right. I think about data in the same way. Data is good, but if, if we stop there, if we don't apply the wisdom of experience and all of the knowledge that we've gathered about our students to making decisions, we are falling into that fallacy. We're falling into that fallacy that data is, is that crystal ball that's going to tell us the future of our students and solve all our problems. Yeah. And that some of the other articles you recommended too, Leo, are kind of talk about that in education is that you know, we get, we often just get a report and it says that the, you know, students did these things. They didn't, they didn't get these answers right on these questions. And so teachers are often left not knowing what to do with that, right? They often are teaching it the same way because that they don't have another way. That's their way to do it. Right. That's how yeah. I know how to do it. So I'm going to teach it again in the same way. Um, and that, that that hasn't really produced many results. So yeah, that like, what do I do with this data that <laughs> that y'all are giving me? And and I don't know that we all have the the best answers because I think it goes back to what Lori said too. Is like we got to make sure the assessment is actually good <laughs> before we're using that data uh, in a, in a way that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think a lot of the answers are on us in the world of designing assessments. So it's mm-hmm. it's not fair to expect teachers or even school leaders to to be able to peer under the hood. Like I mentioned, sometimes they don't have access, yeah. and even if they could, they may yeah. not have the training in, in in assessment literacy to really understand what's going on there. And I, I see that in the same way I look at curriculum. Like we don't expect teachers to be experts at writing curriculum. That's why having a high quality curriculum at hand is so important. I see the same with assessments. It's on assessment developers to be a lot more thoughtful about what we're offering and its effects in the classroom. Because the truth is a lot of the assessments out there in the marketplace are not very effective in terms of driving student achievement. Neither is the time teachers spend interpreting the results. And this has been studied. And there was a a great article in the Heckinger Report recently um, citing some some research by Susan Burkhart at Duquesne University. And and Burkhart looked at um, studies of, of time teachers spent studying data from uh, interim and, and, and benchmark assessments and found that there, there was actually no benefit to it. It, 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 does, it hasn't actually been shown to, to improve student achievement. And think about all the time. I mean, you two remember as teachers, like all the time we spent analyzing data and also being trained on how to analyze data so that we could do X with the reports and how much time that took away from what we could have been doing otherwise. Like I don't know, teaching or planning how to teach our students. <laughs> I know. So it's also a trade-off. You know, even, even the best report takes a while to understand and a while to decide what to do with. What do you what could you have been doing with that time otherwise? Yeah, that's such a good point. And I always think about how my connection to using data really didn't come to fruition until I had high quality materials in front of me because I was able to see that the different sources for data and the regular ongoing, you know, assessments that I was giving my students, that's when I could see the change happening in the classroom in instruction. And then I could see it on the, on the other end as well, but mostly it's because everything was connected. And I think the data prior to that was not only disconnected, but it, it just didn't feel like it, the input, like, you know, like I said earlier, that input and output just were completely disconnected. So when, when the input and the output were much more connected, it, I could see what that could look like and really what that should look like. But it was very hard to see that without a, an example in front of me. And so I'm just like imagining people listening, thinking, yes, this all sounds like what I'm experiencing, but 
I don't really actually understand what it should look like. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know if Lior, this is, this is like a good thing to key you up for right now, but it was helpful for me when we talked about in the pre-call, uh, the Nate silver accuracy and precision target image. Is that, am I talking about that without talking about that <laughs> or maybe well, not? Well, well, I think, I think that, that precision versus accuracy is, is relevant to this, this problem of, of what, what claims and, and what actions a teacher can take after the assessment. So you're talking about the outputs, right? And, and the challenges around deciding what to do, what action do we take? Mm-hmm. So I, I see this problem when, um, I'll give you an example. My, my kids take, um, I'm not going to name it because I don't want to get in trouble if any lawyers are listening, but a very commonly <laughs> used um, interim assessment tool in elementary school. A, a lot of, a lot of uh, you who have kids out there probably are taking the same ones. There's a few out there that are commonly used and, and they give back sort of this nice glossy report report about how well the student is doing on reading and writing. And, and I look at my student, my kids results um, and, and they're very precise. And what do I mean by that is they're, they're down to the number. So it'll say like, you know, X in, 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 in fourth grade is at 92% on this particular domain and 86% on this particular domain. And I always wonder like, how, how do they really know? Like 86%, like, did, did you really ask a um, hundred questions and get 86 answers? Or, you know, did you ask 50 questions and get half of those? Like these tests are pretty short. And so this, this gets into this concept of, of the, the difference between precision and accuracy. So Nate Silver wrote about this in his book, The Signal and the Noise. And, and he's not talking about education. He's talking about statistical analysis in general, whether it's elections or weather or baseball, whatever you're applying to. And he has this, this analogy of, of shooting arrows at a target where you can be very precise and get all of your arrows nicely clustered together, but they may be on the outer rims of your target and nowhere near the bullseye. So this is often what what we see in assessment reports, 92.3. Wow, that is a precise number. And because it's precise, it gives the illusion that the machine, the mechanism that led to that number really knows what it's doing to a very high degree of accuracy. But just because it's precise doesn't mean it's accurate, right? That those, those, those clusters of arrow shots maybe fall from, far from the bullseye. So accuracy means that like, like your arrows are actually close to the bullseye. You're actually hitting the target you mean. So, so what does that mean for assessment inferences? It doesn't matter whether, whether the number is 92.6 or 92 or 90. Does it accurately describe something about what the student can do in, in some kind of transferable way? And oftentimes, if, if an assessment report is, is too precise, I get suspicious. Like, <laughs> I, I, I am suspicious of the 92.6% <laughs> because I know how these assessments are built. I know they're not that accurate. And also because of what the three of us and many others now know, especially over the past few years, a lot of the conversations about the challenges of literacy assessment and reading comprehension assessment in particular, right? And the idea that a score on a reading assess- comprehension assessment is not necessarily transferable or universally applicable because it's so context dependent. So when my daughter's report says she is a uh, 92 or whatever at reading um, informational texts of this particular structure, I know that's meaningless information, right? <laughs> can you, can you go through, like, I just, you're so smart. Thank you for being here today. Like, can you <laughs> go through as a, as, as a specialist in what you do and talk to parents and teachers listening and explain why it is meaningless? Because I agree. I also put those reports on the table and don't take much stock in them, right? Like, because I, I know, but I'm, I'm hoping that you can elevate this in a way that is it would make more sense than me trying to trudge through the mud and explain it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, this is where things get really technical and, and I find it fascinating because I love to geek out on assessment, but well, listen, we knew down. this was going to be a good podcast, Lior, when you <laughs> said psychometrician, which in the, within the first 30 seconds of the podcast, <laughs> I was like, yes, we are here for assessments today. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here to geek out with me. But We're if here. it gets too geeky or in the weeds, just let me know. We, can pull we back. love it. Uh, and any psychometricians who are listening, just sign off for a few minutes because you're not going to let them know the same. And we'll see you later. So, um, so I'll start by by quoting um, Hugh Katz, who has written a lot about this lately. So, so a recent paper by Hugh Katz out of Florida State University is called "Why State Reading Tests Are Poor Benchmarks to Student Success." So we're talking about reading comprehension, right? 
we're not talking about early grades reading when we're focused mm -hmm. on students' foundational skills. Can they decode? Can they read fluency? We're talking about once students have mastered the foundations of reading and we're looking at comprehension. So this is what Katz writes. Transfer is a critical variable in assessing comprehension because comprehension is not a single construct. It is a multifaceted phenomenon that is dependent on many factors. So what does he mean by that? Comprehension is not a single construct. We know how important knowledge is to reading. I know you two have talked about that on your podcast a lot. For sure. And we know how texts that are knowledge rich differ and how students differ in the knowledge stores that they're bringing into texts. So for example, I'll, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. My wife is a, is a cancer researcher. She works in a lab and does very um, advanced and fancy experiments that I do not begin to understand because I don't have a degree in, in biology or chemistry. And she writes papers about them. And I consider myself a, a pretty good reader. I'm sure you, you, you two do as well. After all, we're English teachers. I've read her papers before. I should say I've tried to read her papers before. <laughs> and I, I just have to stop after the first paragraph. Like, I, I literally do not understand a sentence. And it's not that I'm a bad reader. It's that I lack the background knowledge to understand what she's writing about. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't have the concepts. I don't have the references. And the inferences, my goodness, like these papers are so mm -hmm. dense that every sentence implies a certain body of knowledge without explicitly calling attention to it. Why? Because for her audience, it would be pedantic to explicitly spell out, this is what a cell is, and this is what cancer is, and this is how tumors grow. They know that. Right. <laughs> they don't need that background information. But if you don't have it, you're going to miss those. You're not going to be able to make those inferential bridges to understand sentence level. So, you know, if you gave me a reading comprehension test on one of her cancer research articles, I would fail, and I'd feel pretty bad about it. And maybe my teacher would <laughs> punish me in some way. I don't know, put me in, in the slow reading group. And I, I mean, I'm being facetious, but this is literally what happens in right. school, right? Yeah. Kids aren't given cancer research papers, but they're given reading comprehension tests that are about topics X, Y, and Z. No one knows what the topics are going to be. They're kept under wraps. They're secret because the assessments have to be the assessment vendors have to be able to sell these assessments again and again. And if the passages get out, then they can't reuse them. Like it's been a security breach. And if, if students don't have a, a strong content knowledge, especially a broad depth of content knowledge across many topic areas, they might do really well on one text and not really well on the other. So if you're going to look at the score from one text or even a couple or a handful of texts on a reading assessment, especially if that assessment isn't from your curriculum, meaning it's about topics that may or may not be connected to what students are studying in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You can't really transfer that number. You can't really say, you know, Melissa is an 80 when it comes to reading. Lori is a 90 when it comes to reading. No, like Melissa was an 80 yesterday when she read texts about X, Y, and Z. She may be a 95 tomorrow when she reads texts about her favorite topic that she's been studying uh, and reading about and, and, and checking out all the books in the library about. So, so that's, that's really what Katz is getting into, right? Reading comprehension is not a single construct. It's a multifaceted phenomenon. I was just talking about knowledge. We could talk about other factors that right. go into it, right? <laughs> Vocabulary. How about motivation? And none of this is going to show up on the report. All you're going to see on the report is this misleadingly precise number that, again, leads to terrible things happening. Students being placed in reading groups where they are barred from access to high-quality texts. Um, students being labeled as poor and struggling readers and not receiving the instruction and especially the content instruction that they need to actually grow uh, and advance to the highest levels. And research has shown this, like once kids are placed in the low reading group, they rarely leave. Mm -hmm. and it's usually a sentence mm -hmm. for life. So th these are real stakes. Like when we talk about garbage in, garbage out and and some of the the decisions right that are made based on, on this misleading reading comprehension data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Leora, I just want to take a quick second to, I'm going to pause. I'm not going to back up though, Lori. I'm just going to pause <laughs> um, to talk about the foundational skills for just a second, because I think it's the opposite end of what you're saying. And, yeah. you know, you know, if, if I notice that, you know, Lori is struggling with the sound, the letter M makes for, for instance, every time she reads aloud, that's my data, right? I see it. I've seen it multiple times. For some reason, she's saying the, sound of the letter N when it's a letter M, right? I can teach that to her. And once she gets that actual sound of the letter M, it is transferable. And for the most, for most kids in most texts, in most words, it will transfer, right? Now she's got that down and it's done. 
And that it was a total like that's when data like that is transferable, transferable and makes much more sense to use the data in that way. But when it's something like a question about the main idea, well, <laughs> again, there's like, you know, you can't just say I always have that one because I remember sitting my first year and someone asking, like, did they master the main idea? And I'm like, well, for that text, I guess so. But <laughs> like, I, that doesn't mean every time they're asked a question about the main idea, they're going to get it because it depends on the text, depends on their background knowledge. It depends on so many other things. Yeah, exactly. That's such a good point. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the problem I see with assessment literacy is that people t tend to apply sort of these, these blanket ways mm -hmm. to interpret data. And I see this a lot when I work with, with district data offices who are used to receiving data in a certain format, or they have a database set up in a certain way that can only re um, receive certain fields. So th there is no recognition of, of this idea that you're getting at, Melissa, which is different assessments have different purposes and, and different reports should be read and interpreted in different ways. Are you assessing something that's very concrete, that's repeatable, that's a skill? Then absolutely, the report might be very precise in spelling out those skills. And then you can isolate those skills and work on them with students. Because like you said, being able to pronounce a letter is a transferable skill. Um, I, I love the analogy Tim Shanahan always uses. It compares it to riding a bike. You know, if I know how to ride a bike today, I know how to ride a bike tomorrow. I can ride a bike across the world in another continent. I, I can, can probably ride, ride someone else's winter. bike. <laughs> I can ride someone else's bike. It doesn't matter, right? You, you can't make the same type of claim about identifying and understanding the main idea. Just because I understand the main idea of this text doesn't mean I understand the main idea of another text. Right. But you would never know that looking at assessment reports, right? right? They're often standardized and are at the same level of, of precision, the same type of data, the same type of fields, the same organization based on standards. And it often leads to, to the data being treated in the same way where everything is treated as a skill that's repeatable, that can be taught and drilled when some things, especially reading comprehension, are much more complex performances. Yeah. This is so much to take in. So thank you for explaining that so articulately. And I will say I also like to that end, I also found one of my favorite clips as you were sharing, Lior, um, Sonia Santelises, who we've interviewed previously on the podcast. There is this fantastic one minute YouTube clip of her talking about educational redlining in the form of reading groups. And you, she asks who gets to stay and who gets to go. And it, it, yeah. when you mentioned that about like once you place students in those those low groups based on these assessments that we know aren't giving us the best data, that they tend to stay there. And that's a, a big, big problem um, for many other many, many problems happening there in that sentence. But um, can't can't recommend that one minute clip enough. Real powerful of uh, of Dr. S talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's incredibly powerful. And it, it doesn't mean that I don't think she's advocating this either, that we throw assessments out. No. But again, we go back to, to what Jay McTigg reminds us of, like assessments are about teeing up inferences. And inferences are just that. They can be wrong. <laughs> they can be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. So let's take a measure of humility before we use those inferences to make life-changing decisions for students who have no say in the matter. Oh, okay. So I kind of want to transition, Melissa. I'm not sure where you want to go, but I'll go take I'll take a jump. Okay. <laughs> um, so can we? I really am dying to do this. Can we debunk some stuff about standards aligned assessments? <laughs> I'm just going to go for it because that's that's the part that I've like highlighted as my the part that I'm really <laughs> excited to talk about today. Um, I really am. I I'm excited to debunk the idea behind standards aligned assessments, because I think um, there's so much, so many questions out there about standards aligned report cards, standards aligned everything. And we know that when we have high quality materials, the standards are embedded within. They're everywhere, always, all the time. And so to try to parse those out <laughs> to to find like if they if students can do one thing on an assessment, again, if we're not talking about foundational skills um, or to find one thing that students can, quote, master if they, um, you know, if I'm trying to grade a student on their report card, it just it feels that feels insurmountable to me. It feels impossible. And I'm curious what you think about it. Oh, boy. Wow. How much time do we have? <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, I think you said you slotted an extra bit of time after this. I don't know how long these podcasts are, but, you know, if anyone's still listening at this point, they're showing great dedication to geeking out on assessments with us. So let's just just roll with it. I I, I honestly think there are so many questions about assessments. We do. Yeah, we get a lot of questions. Yeah, we get a lot of questions. So I think everybody's going to be very excited to hear from you, Lior. Okay. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll try my best to answer that very complicated question. Um, And and, and and please uh, help me out and jump in with with more questions and redirections. So l- l- let me start by answering that a little bit obliquely with with a story. Um, and again, I want to I want to cite Jay McTigg here from his his um, keynote address at last year's Beyond Multiple Choice because I, I think it was so brilliant and and I just want to share it with all of this audience who, who may not have been there uh, listening live when I was. So, so he shares this story, or not really a story, maybe more of like an anecdote, um, and it comes from from Grant Wiggins. And again, you, you all know Grant Wiggins' work. I think we've all sort of based our curriculum design theories on, on what he and McTigg and others wrote about uh, in terms of backward design. So, so Wiggins has this teaching that, that McTigg shared, and he says, don't confuse the measures or format of an assessment with the goals. So let me say that one more time. Don't confuse the measures or format of an assessment with the goals. What do I mean by that? Think about how students typically practice for a standardized test in this country. So Wiggins likens practicing for a standardized test to practicing for your physical exam to become healthy. (laughs) So think, think about that for a second. Like if I have a physical coming up in a month, and, you know, I'm talking to my wife about it after dinner and the kids are in bed. I'm like, hey, I'm really worried about this physical. Like, I haven't been eating well during this pandemic. <laughs> We've been ordering out a lot. I keep stealing my kids' chocolate from the candy jar. They don't know. Like, I'm worried. Like, what is my weight going to be? What are my cholesterol numbers going to be? And and my wife is like, oh, well, let's just practice. Like, I, I, got, a, I got a blood pressure monitor here. Let's just every day between now and then we're going to test your blood pressure. You will be ready. <laughs> no, like that's ridiculous. No one would do that. That's insane. <laughs> and yet, that's how we prepare kids for for tests in this country. Essentially, yeah. like, how do we prepare them for standardized tests? They take a bunch of standardized tests. <laughs> you bubble in a bunch of multiple choice questions. You all remember the scantrons, right? Like all the practice. Oh my Make gosh. sure your pencil marks are inside the bubble. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Traumatizing memories. So why why is this relevant to your question? That scenario is is a classic example of confusing the format of the assessment for the goals. The format of the assessment might be multiple choice. And I look at standards in the same way. Standards can provide a format for the assessment. They can provide its structure. Yeah. But they're very rarely the actual goals of the assessment. Why do we give reading comprehension assessment? Why do we give end of year standardized reading assessment? Is our goal to see that students have masterized the particular skills enumerated in the standards? Is our goal to see that students can master standard RL23 and RL27 and RL29? I'm not saying those things aren't important, but I am saying that we have a bigger goal. Our goal is that all students can independently successfully comprehend texts at an appropriate complexity level for their grade level, ideally a range of texts about different topics um, and of, of different genres and formats. That's, that's our goal. Mm-hmm. So when we overly focus on the format and structure of assessment, we often miss out on, on what matters. And this gets into preparation. Is the best way to prepare for a multiple choice test to take a bunch of multiple choice questions? No, it's actually <laughs> to learn the knowledge that you're being asked about. Right? <laughs> so it, we can talk more later about what that means for ELA because it's, it's hard to define because the standards don't actually spell out knowledge. But again, like I, I look at standards-based based reporting in the same way. So standards can give you insight. They're not always and not often the goal. And especially when it comes to reading comprehension assessment, because of the way reading comprehension works, because it's a complex, multifaceted performance, standards aligned data is not actually going to give you insight into what your students know and can do in any kind of meaningful way. And this has been studied. So there's been been research that has shown that when students take standardized reading assessments and their performance varies, you know, they do well on some questions and do well on other questions, it's not because they're really good at answering question type X. You know, they're really good at answering questions about cause and effect or because they're really good at, at answering questions about standard Y, right? About discerning the main idea. 
what tends to, to cause the variance in performance is the complexity of the text and their knowledge and whether they have knowledge of the topic or not. That's what makes a difference. So to, to create a report that sort of implies that Lior could be in some kind of universal or fixed or constant way, really good at reading standard 2.7, but not really good at reading 2 standard 2.3, it's simply not true. It's yeah. not a true statement of me. It's not a true statement of how reading works. And yet, because this data is taken at face value, and so what happens if, if Lior doesn't do well on items aligned to 2.3, he's going to get a lot of drills and a lot of boring, disconnected work that has no connection whatsoever to the <laughs> curriculum, is completely incoherent, it's just a bunch of drills, I know I'll, I'll get a bunch of multiple choice questions about identifying the main idea or whatever, without actually building knowledge that I would need on a real assessment to identify yeah. the main idea of an unknown text and an unknown topic. So again... I'm talking about literacy assessment and reading comprehension in particular. Every assessment is different. Context is different. In math, it can make more sense to look at standards because those are often the goals. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in a math assessment, you could have a standard that says, know your multiplication facts on single digit numbers. That is a standard. And it's a very clear goal of the assessment. Right. And, and that's just how math works. So right? it's, it's your, in math, it's easier to sort of enumerate those very discrete, repeatable skills that you can teach and you can test. And there's more of a straight through line. So reading comprehension, things just get a lot more complicated uh, because it is the most complex thing, maybe second to writing, that we ask students to do. And there's just so many things mentally, cognitively, emotionally that a student needs to do to understand a text well. It is impossible to capture that in a single standard or in even a group of standards. Yeah, that's so, that was great. <laughs> I actually had a really amazing conversation one time with Tim Shanahan, which was exciting, um, where he, he wow, said, Wow, I'm jealous. I know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But he, he did say that. He said, <laughs> you know, a better thing to do with, with this data, which he still said it's, you know, you're still making inferences, right? You're still going to be guessing. But he said a better thing to do than going down each standard would be to like look at, okay, I have my class, which, which, passages did they tend to do better with? Which passages did they tend to not do as well with? And then actually dig into the passages, the texts themselves, and start to look at like, well, maybe why, you know, like, and again, you're making inferences there, you're guessing you're not going yeah. to get anything specific. But he still said that's a better route to go because you're looking at the text themselves. And I, I'm often teachers are not even given the text. I know that's what I was just going them, to say. Let al <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let alone totally. like actually yeah. looking at those texts. That's the, that's the problem, and it's so obvious that everyone ignores it. So yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make a pitch here. When can you look at the text? The only time you can do that is in curriculum embedded assessments. Mm -hmm. Every other assessment product you're gonna do interim benchmark summative predictive. You're not gonna have access to that because those are products that are sold. And for, for reasons of economics, often need to be reused year after year. Mm -hmm. They're not going to tell you the text. You can do that with curriculum embedded assessments because yeah. it's less formal, because there aren't stakes involved, and because you know the text and content. After all, it's the curriculum that you're teaching. So, so when we talk about the time teachers spend on data, and you know, I, I often wonder, like um, Susan Burkhart did that analysis of, of interim tests. I, I wonder if someone would do a similar study of curriculum embedded assessments, like teachers spending time digging into those and not just looking at the data. But as you said, Melissa, the data is a pathway back to the content. Mm -hmm. So if, if I have a curriculum embedded assessment on a text that's aligned to the topic I'm teaching in my ELA unit or module, and there are 10 items and students bomb item two, they just really don't do well. OK, there's data. Item two. Students got 10 percent. Bad. That can only tell me so much. What was item two? What was it asking about? What part of the text was it about? Was it about paragraph number two in the text? Okay, what was in that paragraph? Were there some hard words that may have confused students? Great, let's teach the words. Like, right. let's not waste time <laughs> asking what standard item two is about or what right. the format was. Or asking that let's same question again and again. <laughs> exactly, it's, 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 it's madness. And yet it, it's not done because again, the assessments that everybody pays attention to, that teachers spend the most time on because their leaders emphasize them the most are those big ticket items there, the interims, the summatives and the benchmarks. Let's do the data analysis on curriculum embedded assessments. Let's use the time wisely because that actually gets us past the numbers and allows us to return the content and return students to the curriculum they've been studying, which of course also has the benefit of coherence. It's no longer, all right, time to stop learning. It's test prep time for the next month. <laughs> right. It's just more learning. It's just what we do. It's value.
It also makes a lot of sense, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's just <laughs> just being honest. I mean, to hear you say, like, if you're looking at paragraph two and then trying to figure out what standards that's addressing. Well, I mean, just looking at the vocabulary and then teaching students both that vocabulary as well as other connected vocabulary, exploring more content on that same topic. That seems I mean, much more exciting as a student. Also much more sensical as, as an educator, but we do the opposite. So how, I, I guess, like, how can we train ourselves to do what makes sense in this assessment world that sometimes doesn't? I don't expect you to have the answer to that. I'm just Oh, good. I was, I was trying to look at your, your eyes and whether you're looking at me. That's a really good question. <laughs> what do you think, Lord? I'm like, no, you're it, the yeah. expert. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is a great question. I don't, I don't have a single answer. It's something that, that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about and, and something that, that we've been working on, on internally. Um, you know, so I, I do think it has, it has to start with leaders. Like, you can't just be on teachers to make that shift because teachers can go to their leaders and say, well, I would much rather spend time looking at curriculum embedded assessment data than I would on interim assessment data. But if the leader says, this is a requirement, this is what you have to do, it's not gonna make a difference. So it's really important when you have these conversations that you have um, what I've often heard referred to as a vertical spine, which is teachers, supervisors, curriculum people, coaches, principals, and the people at the district level who design and, and own these data systems all has to be aligned and they all have to align on the same goal. And it takes a lot of courage and it's hard to make that shift. Like everybody along that vertical spine has to agree that what we're doing isn't working. Um, and it's been done before. Like, it's not like it's impossible. So one of the most inspiring case studies I've seen about this comes from Payman Ruhanifar. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name, but he was the, the former superintendent of Camden. New Jersey, mm-hmm. and and Payman wrote in um, in Chalkbeat a few years ago, just reflecting on his experiences. This is after he left Camden, and it was basically like a mea culpa about how he presided over this data regime and had his teachers and leaders mm-hmm. spending so much time with their heads down looking at assessment data, and he he realized that it was harmful, and he actually overruled his own cabinet, his own board that was really pushing for continued emphasis on the big two, reading and math assessment and giving all these interims and looking at this data and setting targets based on this data. He realized how much it was taking away from his school system's ability to teach arts and and civics and physical education and history and science, all these other things that are important too and aren't tested as often. And also, by the way, not just important in their own right, but have huge benefit for literacy in Mm -hmm. terms of building that knowledge and also all the time teachers are spent studying that data and being trained on how to study that data instead of actually teaching so so he just had to put his hand down and say stop and that that moment of leadership was was a great example of of courage right bucking that that trend of of that data regime so so i think that's that's part of i don't know if that's a full answer to your question but i think that's part of the answer is you need teachers invested but you also need courageous leadership who who are willing to take the risks and take them there Because let's be honest, a lot of the things that you would do, like what would you as a school leader do if you weren't staring at the data wall all day and making (laughs) data-based decisions? You could do great things like implement high-quality knowledge-building curriculum. You could improve the the mental health services your school system is applying to students. You could enrich your students' lives with really meaningful content-rich electives. None of those things are going to boost standardized test performance in a week or in two weeks or in a month. Like knowledge building is in the long game. It takes time. So it takes a lot of courage to be able to do those things and say, you know what, I'm not going to let the accountability regime tell me what to do because that's just a losing game. It's just always focused on short term things, boosting test scores for the sake of boosting test scores for the sake of boosting them again. And it's just spinning wheels like no one's getting anywhere. So it, it, it is it is rare to find people who are willing to, to actually speak out and do something different. Yeah. I also think keep thinking about the parents in this scenario, like as a parent, it wouldn't feel good to know that your child or your children were being t- prepared to test for a month or two or three, which does happen. You know, we've seen it. Um, that doesn't feel good to know that my child is going to school every day and then practicing taking a test that's going to happen in one, two, three, four months. I, you know, I want my child to go to school and learn as I'm sure you both do as well. And come home excited about learning and, and fostering curiosity. And so I know that we all know this. I'm just saying out loud, like just thinking about every stakeholder involved, like the winning 
winning way to go about this is certainly not that uh, preparation piece. It's doing what you just shared, Lior. Yeah. Engagement matters. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. How often do kids come home and say, hey, Dad, I had a great day of school today. I had the best assessment. I really love that interim. <laughs> love Let that tell test. You, so it was fun. well designed and psychometrically sound. <laughs> and I, I want to say, I, I joke, but like, I love psychometricians. All you psychometricians out there, much love. Like, don't, don't misinterpret <laughs> my message here. They are essential and they're very smart and, and in, incredibly bright at what they do. But if, if psychometric decisions drive everything, we, we, we'll just continue doing what we're doing, which is these, these incredibly sterile standardized tests that overly focus on multiple choice to the exclusion of performance tasks and authentic texts. And again, teachers unable to see the contents of those assessments because they're all under wraps. So from a psychometric perspective, do we lose some validity with curriculum-based assessment? Because yes, could my kid tell me about the text he read uh, in his module assessment the other day? Could I tell another parent? Could that another parent tell a kid? Could my kid tell his younger sibling who might remember a year? I mean, I think these are unlikely. Like, I don't think there's a huge market in like trafficking in secrets in the same way there would be for like an SAT, something with real stakes. But okay, even if that did happen and, and the validity goes down a little bit, I think it's still worth it, right? What are the trade-offs? So going back to what you mentioned, Lori, engagement. Did Are kids actually enjoying? Are they engaged? Are they motivated? Are they trying their hardest? You know, I work, I work in assessment and I never want a, a student to go home and say the assessments are the best part of, of what I, the most exciting <laughs> and fun part of what I do. No, they're always going to be a part of schooling and they're important. But the real engagement is, is, is what comes from the content, right? That core content, that's instruction every day. And that's what I want people to be focusing on. And when students are taking assessments and teachers are studying assessment results, the best thing I can hope for is that they return immediately to that curriculum content and that the assessment inspires them to go back instead of inspiring them to do what you're talking about, Lori, which is like the endless test prep or like, God forbid, the uh, the, the, the test pep rally that you hear about. Oh, in schools. I know. And it's like, let's take a day out of learning to have a pep rally to get excited about a test that is clearly not exciting or else you wouldn't have had <laughs> a pep rally for it in the first place. Like you're really telling on yourself by having these, right? How unengaging and completely disconnected from any real learning going on in the classroom are, are yeah. these these standardized and speaking of assessments? mental health, I mean, if, if I'm a student uh, who has any kind of anxiety or worry about tests or assessment, or a reading. whole day, uh, or, or, re, or thank you, or reading, <laughs> a, or writing, a whole day of rallying for an upcoming assessment would just send me, that, uh, that would really send me. Yeah off the edge. I'd be very upset. I would go home feeling really badly and it would do the opposite of, I think what it would aim to do. So that's a good point, Lee, yeah. or those, oh, all those pep rallies. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And I love a good pep rally. Let's, let's do it for sports, <laughs> right? Let's do it for cheerleading. Like, let's do it for something like that. We let's do it for all the things that we've learned about, you know? <laughs> yes. Let's have a knowledge yeah. pep rally. Yeah. That's a great idea. <laughs> Well, we're so, giving all of the teachers listening some really good ideas and knowledge, knowledge pep, pep rallies. rallies. That's uh, so fun. Yeah. yeah. You all should market some pom poms. Do you have any blue and silver pom poms? I do have blue and silver pom poms in my of house, but they're do. not they're not branded <laughs> Melissa and Lori. They could be. <laughs> well, I'll have to ask for that. <laughs> well, before we end, I just want to make sure both of you mentioned earlier about some positive things that are happening in the world of assessment and data. And I don't want to not <laughs> talk about those things before we go. I don't know exactly what you all were referring to, so <laughs> I'm just leaving it to you. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so I'll share a couple of thoughts, and I'd, I'd love to hear what you two have, have noticed as well. Um, yeah. So I think like a, a positive takeaway that I would encourage you to think about is, is just to be, be deliberate and thoughtful about assessments and just ask some basic questions. And I think asking these questions can really help, especially if you're stuck with an assessment you don't like or that you didn't mm. choose. This is reality. It's going to happen, yep. right? As a teacher, you're not going to be able to choose. So I think the first question you should ask, and, and this, is, this is Todd Rose poses this question in, in his Garbage In, Garbage Out article, just ask, are the data useful? Um, you know, just, just try to find out as much as you can about the, the design of the assessment and whether it is actually designed to, to, to lead to the inferences that are actually meaningful. And you as a teacher, you know your, your subject area best. You know what reading comprehension is. You know what math is. You know what foundational skills are. Are the data actually useful in teaching those things? So that was the first question. Um, and then the next question I would ask is, how are we preparing students for the assessments? And are we confusing the goals for the format? Are we letting the format drive our preparation 
as opposed to the goals. And mm -hmm. if you remember those goals, often if the assessment is good or even solid, there's going to be some, some solid content or skills based or, 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 or subject matter related goals in there that you can always go back to focus on instead of just thinking, how can I train my students to fill out bubbles? <laughs> and then the, the last thing that I'll mention, and maybe we could talk about this on a future podcast if, if we're running out of time, although I'm happy to talk about it more now if you do have time, is there's some really interesting innovations going on in the state standardized assessment space around literacy, mm -hmm. uh, starting in Louisiana, uh, where we're working on an innovative assessment that is actually aligned to the curriculum students are studying uh, as opposed to completely disconnected topics. So it's, it's starting small. It's just in Louisiana now, but it's getting a lot of attention. And, and I'm really hoping that a lot of these innovative assessments can, can spread. And, and to me, like the implication of innovative is very simple. Try something different. It's not the way assessments are typically done. It's not the most psychometrically easy way. But this project, and, and I'm working on it, Great Minds is, is participating as, as, a, as a curriculum partner for this. We have psychometricians on the project. like They're involved. We're not cutting them out. But it is much more of a collaborative process where people who understand content in the subject matter area are weighing in on the design of the assessment, on what text we use, and on how those assessments do a much better job of capturing and reflecting what students are learning in the classroom versus your typical uh, end of year reading test. So that's just a little teaser for uh, any future conversations. So happy yes. to talk more about that. We will definitely have a future podcast about that. <laughs> I know. I feel like we could keep going forever. I'm so <laughs> glad that you coded that as innovative assessments, though, because I haven't had the words to, I wasn't sure what to call it. So it's these, these brilliant assessments that are happening in Louisiana <laughs> is how I've been explaining it. But I love the saying, having a new phrase now, these innovative assessments um, that are prioritizing kind of the knowledge and what students are learning throughout the year. So it feels connected to what they're doing. That's awesome. I can't wait to learn more about that. Yeah, it's really exciting work. All right, Leo, you just gave some really good advice, but we always still ask <laughs> at the end for our guests or to our guests to leave our listeners a piece of advice. So if you have one last thing you would tell teachers, leaders, anyone working with assessments, especially in our with reading comprehension specifically, but could be anything. Oh boy. So. <laughs> I know you gave really good advice with those questions. I feel like I should have, yeah, we should have yeah. waited and you could have given that. No, that, was, that was good that you're holding that for the end. That's like when, when I listen to, to Terry Gross on NPR, the people she's interviewing are always like, Whoa, Terry, like that's a tough question. That was like a Terry Gross type of, type of tough All question. Right. So I want to see if I can, I can rise to that. Um, so it, it may be kind of, kind of cliched and bland, but, but I will just say, cause I, I truly do believe in it that, you, whoever you are out there, a teacher, a parent, a student, are never defined by an assessment. Assessment is not who you are, especially one single assessment. This is basic. I don't think anyone really disagrees with that, but it really is striking how, like, in practice, it, it seems like a lot of people actually are, are doing things that, that make it seem like an assessment really is a label. Yeah. So I, I there, and that, that, that can also be hard to internalize. You know, as a parent, I get, I get those reports back from my students. And as someone who works in the assessment industry, I know they're not of high value. But I forget in the moment, absolutely. Like when I see my daughter and, and it says, like, this is her percentage compared to other kids in the country, I'm like, oh, who are those other X percent of kids who are better than, really? No, my no, daughter's it's, the best. Like, it's very upsetting. Because <laughs> we are emotionally, for, for obvious reasons, attached to those yeah. results. You know, we, we feel like they, they, they somehow describe our value. They don't. Like assessments are limited. They are flawed. They're important, but they're limited. They're never going to tell everything. So one result from a test doesn't define you. And there are so many things that can go wrong in a test and a very few things that can go right. <laughs> it's, it's actually surprising anyone does do well in assessment considering that. <laughs> Um, and so for, you know, for all those students out there who struggle with assessments and all those teachers out there who struggle with low scores, it doesn't mean that you should ignore those. And there are, there are things that we can talk about to help students improve, things that really matter. Um, but in the end, it's, it's, it's not who you are. Uh, I've, never, I've never seen a job where like SAT scores show up in the application, <laughs> right? Or your score on uh, your, your high school end of year exam or that kind of thing. Yeah. Sure, there are stakes and accountability. So you got to pay attention to it. Like you got to prepare and some of those things we can debate, like whether it's right to attach accountability to those things. But at the end, it's just a test. And there, there's so much more that, that goes into what makes 
a human a human. Um, what makes a reader a reader, what makes a writer a writer, that will never be captured by assessments because they're so blunt as instruments. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much, Leo. This was great conversation, great advice to leave us on. We definitely appreciate you, and we're inviting you back to talk to some more experts about assessment along the way. So be ready. Yeah, we we have so many more <laughs> questions on our sheet that we didn't even get to. So thank you for being here today to just step us into assessment, and we'll link all of the uh, resources that you mentioned in our show notes because they are so rich, and we'll make sure that we that everyone has those. Um, but thank you. We can't thank you enough. This. This concept of assessment needs so much more conversation, and we're just really grateful that you said yes to talking about it today. Well, thank you. I, I'm loving this podcasting thing. I, I have no idea how you two do it, and uh, it's, it's <laughs> great. I just feel like it's just three people chatting about education. I know eventually people will listen, but uh, it, it makes it a lot easier when you can't actually see their faces. So it's, it's just fun to, to chat with uh, about these fascinating topics with you two. Thank you for your, for your interest, and yeah, I'd love, I'd love to come back. Uh, hopefully if people listen and are interested and want to hear more, there's, we could talk about assessment for hours and days and days and days. So let's yeah. Going. Well, thank so, you. Thank yes. Thank and I can you. guarantee people will listen. So don't worry about they that. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks for listening. Literacy lovers. We release a new podcast episode every Friday and share more resources in a newsletter on Tuesday. Sign up for our newsletter at literacypodcast.com. Each week, you'll receive important information, resources, and connected content. We're excited to create a space for community discussion about our podcast. We want to connect with our listeners and support you in answering your questions. But we also realize there are a lot of other educators out there who have great advice and experience too. Let's keep learning together in our Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Podcast Facebook group, And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. If the content in this episode helped you, share with a fellow educator and teacher friend. Our Literacy Lover community welcomes educators at every stage of their learning journey. We're so glad you're here to learn with us.